The Indonesian archipelago is by far the world's largest, with 13,677 islands straddling the equator over a distance of more than 5,000 kilometres between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Indonesia is so huge that getting around takes real planning and quite a lot of hard work. A long flight with Indonesia's airline Garuda took us through to Medan, the capital of Sumatra. Our time in Medan was fully covered in part one. Part two saw us at wonderful Lake Toba and on Samosir Island. In part three we drove into the high country beyond and finished up on the equator at Bonjol. Part four will take us to wonderful Bukatingi, to the coast at Padang and on board an aircraft to Jakarta. But first, let us see wonderful, exciting Bukatingi, a magic place. Finally, we had the equator in sight and we staggered slowly right up to it before the bus conked out. This is the equator in Sumatra at the village of Bonjol. There it is, stretches along there. Across from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere. And despite the sick bus, there is Marjorie joyfully crossing the equator from north to south, from north to south, from north to south. It's a wonderful feeling in the wilds of Sumatra. But I do wish that bus was working properly. But hallelujah! Two mechanics at Bonjol helped our driver coax our malingering Mercedes coach back into some sort of life. And we ground our way to Bukatik to our magnificent, new, beautiful, just opened modern hotel, the superb Hotel Pasako, the newest and best and wonderful Bukatingi. And were we relieved to get there, true bliss. So the first thing is to get off to find our room and dress for dinner. This beautiful new hotel was almost unoccupied. We were some of its very first guests and we were thoroughly outnumbered by the staff. On our way to the rooms, along the open air passageways, we did of course see the brooding volcano looming above us but hopefully it will remain quiet while we're here. Showered and dressed and back in the hotel foyer, our guide told us the bad news and the good news. The bad news was that our coach would be in dock to being repaired for the whole of the following day. The good news was that all the big sights to be seen around Bukatingi and the town itself we're all in easy walking distance of our hotel. So we're going to have a great day out tomorrow, just walking around town. Sounds pretty good. So we waited for meal time, and then it was off to bed to rest for a good day coming up tomorrow in Piccadilly. And it was good, really good. Next morning, nine and a half thousand foot high, Mount Marapi was still behaving itself, which was good because it's the most active volcano in the whole of Sumatra and has wreaked havoc in the area in recent years. No word yet about our bus, although we had heard a rumour that it might be finished earlier than expected and maybe might even be available by about lunchtime. So the morning was spent just idly dawdling around the hotel. It was a beautiful spot. This was our very pleasant room and balcony. And how about a wonderful pool? Although there was nobody actually using it, and it is nearly on the equator, but of course it's many thousands of feet high, and therefore a little bit cooler than it might be at sea level. But with a swim up bar, it should have had some customers.
and of course the garden itself were beautiful, absolutely beautiful, with flowing water everywhere, which of course keeps the climate more acceptable for anyone living in this part of the world. Suddenly we got news that the bus might be ready by midday and that we should then be available to drive downtown and explore the wonders of Bikatiki. Suddenly, here it was, still noisy, but we were told that the motor was now in good shape and should get us safely beyond Bikatiki and down to Padang on the coast. So, Bukatingi, here we come. This is the famous Bukatingi clock tower right in the middle of town. Something really special and highly regarded in many parts of the world for its unique style. Anyhow, it's now lunchtime and we're taken to a Chinese restaurant where, frankly, it wasn't the finest meal we've ever had, but we had to fill it quickly and then headed downtown to see the delights of Bukatingi. This restaurant seemed to be rather obsessed with caged birds. The shops in this part of town seem a bit chaotic with all their wares out on the footpath but I guess if you knew where to go there was everything there that you could possibly want. Mukatiki is renowned for its wonderful horses and carts and especially the wonderful headdresses the horses wear and seem to be quite proud of. This one seems to be specially acting for the camera. And everywhere in Bukatingi were the wonderful soaring roofs in renowned Manegaba star, which seemed to be the predominant architecture right through this part of Sumatra. These men gathered on the steps were waiting for the bank to open to withdraw some money for shopping. It was market day and the crowds were quite large and our walk through the markets which followed was quite fascinating to see what was on sale and especially to observe the people doing all the buying. Clearly it was a thriving town and we enjoyed every moment of our walk through it. We briefly joined our bus to head to the other side of town to see the very historic old Dutch fort and the rather interesting museum but disappointing zoo. Hello. This bridge crosses the main traffic artery between the fort and the museum and a big black cloud above burst into a tropical storm which had us running for cover. There were quite a lot of interesting old colonial artefacts in the museum 
but nowhere near as fascinating as we had hoped for, having heard that the collection was quite unique. Next was the zoo, of course, and the wonderful Sumatran orangutan, plus some of the exotic birds of the area. Although the toucans seemed a bit bored and didn't really want to do anything other than just stand around. The zoo itself was quite disappointing too. The unique Sumatran orangutan certainly performed for us, but it was quite sad to see it in this tiny cage. And we were shocked to find that the only exhibit the museum had of the wonderful Sumatran tiger was one which had recently died and had been stuffed. Sad indeed. The museum shop of course had plenty of things to buy, but frankly, we didn't really see anything there we would. Back in town the wonderful horse taxis were still busy, and I'm quite sure that some of them actually posed for the camera. But now we had time to ourselves to really walk through this wonderful city and see how it worked. As you will see the shops were really thriving and the people of Bukatini were buying up big. A truly delightful city and delightful people. It is very much a Muslim city but the people seemed under strain and thoroughly enjoying the holiday market time and we felt so privileged to be there with them and to see them so friendly and happy. In fact we were quite sad when our time to wander around the old town was over and we had to rejoin our bus and head further south. There were magnificent tropical fruits everywhere, especially the wonderful durian and the rambutan. Looking at these stalls, 
The people of Bukatingi certainly have a sweet tooth and enjoy the wonderful array of delights on offer. In fact, there was absolutely everything one could possibly want to buy on display here. The people of Bukatigi really enjoy their shopping on market day. But away we go to see more of the wonderful things around Bukatigi and down to the coast of Badang. I will always remember the chaotic traffic as we headed out of Wikitiki, but our great driver handled the coach really well, and somehow it all seemed to work out. Our first stop just outside town was at the amazing Agarai Canyon. This vista of its wonderful views and gardens is one of the must-do things in Bukatinki. And of course has become a very popular place for vendors of all kinds to sell their wares, curios and collectibles of various kinds including this Watch Me While I Do It painter. This rocky steep sided gorge about two and a half miles long is sometimes quite grandiloquently called the Grand Canyon of Indonesia. It was of course formed in the way distant part as a result of a huge volcanic upheaval which splits Sumatra apart at this point. The rich volcanic soil at the foot of the canyon is of course ideal for agricultural use and has become a plentiful garden for Bukatingi and other parts of Sumatra, growing wonderful tropical fruit and vegetables to feed the island and especially the restaurants at Bukatingi. This woman is weaving wonderful little baskets out of very prickly front, amazing. And now it's time to get back in the coach and head to the other end of the canyon for another view of this wonderful site. It is much wider at this point and also gives a view into the Harog Canyon beyond, which is a game reserve with birds, butterflies, monkeys, tigers even, and steamy rainforests and meadows. But as this is not easily accessible, we didn't actually visit it, being more of a bushwalker's paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. In Sabata all the visitor hotspots seem to have a captive monkey on show, but I think this one was probably better than any we've seen anywhere else. I think you'll agree. Hello. 
This is one smart monkey. He retires to his own sanctuary to enjoy his meal. Heading further towards the coast, we come to Ruba Makan's Pondok Flora Centre. This is a real surprise. I think you will agree. So here we go. Did you hear the fish jumping? This poor old buffalo is working really hard. But the rice paddy just has to be furrowed before it can replant. It's a top quality restaurant, has its own fish ponds, beautiful gardens, grows its own rice, and it was the obvious place to stay for a really good meal and have a good look around its gardens and see how rice is cultivated, planted and harvested. And above all, it had its own ducks. Obviously needed for a really top drawer restaurant. And the duck was good. We had a great meal in typical Padang style. It featured lots of spicy vegetables, rice of course, and a beautiful duck. And looking across the rice paddy, the ducks had had their fill of lovely fresh rice and had settled down to the night and gone to sleep. That's nice. Pariyuyang Palace, the royal palace of the former Yuyang Kingdom, located near the present city of Batasanga, it is absolutely magnificent. It was built in the traditional Rima Gadang architectural style, but with three stories structure and much larger dimension than other Rima Gadang structures. It has a status in West Sumatra, probably equivalent to that of Buckingham Palace in the United Kingdom. Although today there is no king or royal family in the palace, because the original Pagayiran Kingdom was disbanded in 1833, the palace is still held in the highest esteem amongst the Manangkabau people as the descendants of the Minang nobles still seek their roots and links to the former royal house of Pagariyang. Like most such sacred places around the world, it was shoes off of course. Sadly, the palace has been destroyed by fire several times. In 1804 and in 1956 and again in 2007 
Unfortunately, we visited it before it was destroyed in 2007, as this film was in fact shot in 1992. However, it has now been rebuilt, I understand, and today again functions very much in its original style as a museum and very popular tourist attraction. But we were lucky to see it in this grandeur before its total destruction in 2007. I understand the rebuild is very good, but nowhere near as good as the original, because many of the rare ornaments and wonderful hangings could not be replicated. So, let's enjoy the palace in its absolute heyday. The huge crowd present when we saw it says volumes about how important it is to them and their Manikabau history in Sumatra. The young Manikabau people of today really love it. Maybe not quite held in the reverence which their forebears would have bestowed on it, but it is good to see their genuine affection for the place. There was so much to see that Mahanji found it almost impossible to know quite where to start and where to stop. But wandering through its corridors, he found this wonderful collection of handmade pots spun on a potting wheel using local clays assumedly and of a size which even today would be regarded as enormous and indicative of just how skilled the potters were. <laughs> This young Manikabau pony looked most resplendent with his Bukatingi style headdress. It was good to see the picnic style atmosphere which pervaded the place and I guess speaks volumes about how the young people have adopted their old tradition and hold their Manikabau culture in such high esteem. It certainly augurs well for the future development of this area. Sometimes called the Gypsies of Indonesia, the Manikabau people on Sumatra have now reached more than 50 million people, and their influence on the further development of Indonesia is obviously immense. Our next stop at Kuparajo was fascinating because this is the birthplace of ancient Manankabo justice. These very ancient stones allowed the old Manankabo elders to decide between right and wrong in their community and to dispense punishment if needed to the wrongdoer, yet identifying and pardoning the innocent. In essence, it was the stepping stones which made the decisions in disputes between two people, say. And it was decreed that the guilty would make a small hole in the stone, whereas the innocent would pass through totally unscathed. It was pretty rudimentary justice, and without doubt, many guilty people got away with the misdemeanors and crimes, and many innocents were probably given the blame for them, with the gods, in essence, deciding the justice in this instance. Actually, the stone with two holes was a pounding race. I'm not sure how this ties in with the story, but the holding is too complicated anyhow. This 
community has a watchdog and a watchduck. Both pretty noisy as needed, I'm told. Our next stop was at Pariangan, a small Manekabo village on the lower slopes of Bantbarapi. The village is of great cultural and historical significance to the Manekabo people, and local legend states that Pariangan is the oldest of all Manekabo villages, and said to be the best preserved traditional Manekabo village in the whole of Sumatra, containing many traditional houses. Our guide tells us how the Manekabao have over centuries developed the world's best species of rice to grow in the area, with many grains on each stalk to produce very high crop yields, but they still use very traditional means of bagging the rice. And like this traditional practice, its old traditional Manekabao mosque is believed to be the oldest in existence, dating back to the late 18th century. Alongside the mosque even today, are the hot springs from the nearby volcano where communal bathing continues as it has for centuries. Padang Panjang is a substantial town and site of a conservatory of Manekabao dance and music. But we're now short on time and we can stop. We encounter a sudden tropical storm as we descend from the mountains. Approaching Padang, the land gets much flatter along the coast. Okay. And finally we arrived at our overnight hotel Hanjaran. <laughs> but at 5am next morning we're scheduled to fly out to Jakarta. The airport lounge was crowded and the plane was late. But it was a very good flight with new domestic airline Mapati operating a brand new DC-9. Quite delightful tropical cloud formations flying the strait between the islands of Sumatra and Java made the flight quite interesting and picturesque. And landing in Jakarta, we joined a new coach to have a look at a new Jakarta attraction aimed at portraying the style of life in South Sumatra and also in Tarajalan in South Sulawesi where we'll be going in two weeks time. Between the people, eh? and, then, and then we're going to Aceh and then to Toraja. So 140 hectares Borneo or the other. So we have total about 13,677 islands. Panjaya or West New Guinea and then there's a house and then we can go The typical South Sumatran structures were beautifully portrayed 
But frankly, I think they would be better without that canned music. But it was there, and we simply had to wear it. It was a very pleasant diversion on the way to our dignified and well-run Hotel Indonesia Indica, where we will spend a few days before touring Java and Bali, which I hope to edit and upload to YouTube before the 20-year-old tapes deteriorate further. I'll let you know when this happens. Ah, clean toilets and only about two cents Australian. Good value. <laughs> and right ahead were excellent examples of Batak Toba construction, exactly as we had seen them, while on Samasir Island in Lake Toba. Stuff to Louise or Sparosa land in miniature. We also very thoroughly appreciated seeing a preview of what life would be like in South Sulawesi and in Tarajaland, that high country in the central part of South Sulawesi, which we will be visiting in two weeks' time. As we found out, it was very well done, and the reconstruction finished on a very high note, showing the remarkable Tarajan practice of burying their dead in cliffside caves guarded by figurines of the deceased as they proceeded from life on earth to eternal life in heaven. And sadly, this is also the last of the superb Sumatra series. And this is also the end of my video of exciting Bukatingi. But I do hope that I have captured something really good on tape for you to see. So it's au revoir for now.